question. Hello and welcome to Real Talk with Leary. I'm so grateful that we were able to have this discussion. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Thank you for having me on your show. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. Yes, I'm so grateful for Real Talk. And just as a reminder, this is an unedited, unfiltered Real Talk conversation. And Leary, I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Okay, hi. So I'm Leary. Um, I'm an herbalist, an intuitive, and ancestral guide. Um, I've been working with the plants for a long time. I'm also a double Taurus Leo rising. I was born on a new moon. And um, in human design, I'm a reflector. And I feel like those things very much like kind of encompass who I am, um, a good reflection of who I am, I should say. Um, but I've been studying herbalism for pretty much what feels like my whole life. Um, I've done a few like more traditional trainings recently, but um, I grew up very much in like the midst of, I mean, I'm first generation. So in the midst of like two worlds, uh, my family came here um, in the late 80s, uh, escaping a war, a genocide. And so they came here as refugees and they brought a lot of their traditions with them. And I spent my summers going back to Macedonia and Kosovo where my parents are from respectively and um, kind of being half in that world and half in this world. And um, it was definitely like a very liminal experience of like transcending between realms is what it felt like. Cause you know, New York is very much New York. We're like fast paced and super alive. And over there, it's that's just not the case. It's still like, um, you know, very slow and really into agriculture and, and folklore and history. And um, not saying that we're not about that here in New York, but it's just like a little bit of a different pace of things. So my interest in herbalism really sparked from that because I spent so much time outside and so much time in those sort of like really spiritual spaces and um, magic is a big component in all of that and witchery and all of it. So that's kind of how I got started. And I try to keep everything kind of in line with my Balkan traditions, but I've also done trainings in Ayurveda in India. I trained um, with Sacred Warrior in Brooklyn and did like a nine month training. I also went with Vanessa from Sacred Warrior to Scotland and learned about like some Gaelic traditions. And um, yeah, I mean, I've done trainings in like Reiki, yoga, breath work, like kind of off the cuff of so many things. And I'm currently in school for psychology. I'm hoping to apply to a doctoral program probably next year. Um, so I'm really excited for all of these different combinations of like science and magic. And um, joining us today is my dog, Amber. She's like sleeping next to me. She is a Leo <laughs> and she's um, half pit, half Vishla and she has a pretty loud bark. So I'm hoping nobody kind of like comes home in the time of this interview so she doesn't bark, but um, she might, but it's all good. <laughs> So beautiful. I love all the synergy and magic. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's definitely been um, definitely feel very connected to the magic component. Um, and it's not all love and light, you know, it's always like part of the healing process is um, it's like going through the tunnel, you know. Absolutely. And I appreciate you touching upon that. And a quote that's coming to mind is when you're looking at the stars, all of the dark space in between. And when you really change the lens and focus on what's holding it together or what else is there in addition to the light, there's a lot to explore in the shadows. Yeah, definitely. Definitely a lot to explore in the shadows. I think also like, um, like in my culture and in my background, like when we talk about magic, like it's so different. Like I feel like in the wellness industry here and in, you know like the modern western world um when they talk about like they always talk about like light and dark and light and shadow and good and bad and white magic and dark magic and it becomes like this very divisive very like weird thing and i feel as though in my culture like the dark and the light are the same and it's like they just are the same thing and it just is information um, and it's not really labeled as good and bad, like dark magic or like uh, dark energy, I should say, is not like frowned upon or anything like that. It's more so just a different form of energy. And it's something that we can learn from and like transcend from. It's like in tarot, when you pull like the tower card, or if you're looking at your astrology chart and you see Pluto, um, it's just times of transformation. It's not really like a, a good or a bad, like 
you learn the most in those times where things are the toughest. So that's kind of, yeah. So I don't really uh, subscribe to the whole love and light tribe. Not really about that. <laughs> I think it's all is, and it's all like interweb, like interwebbed and interconnected. Uh, it absolutely is. And when we remove the labels, we can really be present with it and feel it. And I really appreciate you mentioning that because I pulled the to tower card this morning. <laughs> it's like, we're transforming over here. No, I love the tower card. That's like one of my favorite cards. Every time I pull it, I'm like, all right, let's do this. Like, let's go. Um, but for anybody out there who's into astrology, I mentioned that like my sun and moon are conjunct in Taurus. And it's opposite uh my Pluto and Scorpio in the fourth house so like I feel like I'm very connected to that Taurus Scorpio polarity and I feel like you know Scorpio is me going to school for psychology and then Taurus is me in herbalism class like it's just that kind of duality that like it's like okay well you can't have the light without the dark so like let's do both let's figure this out how can we marry these two different things together like how can we put academia and holisticism in the same room and see how it works how do we how do we marry that that to me is alchemy um science and magic I love it and I'm also so curious when you mentioned your background of going back and forth to these different energies what practices grounded you to be able to do both I was a child <laughs> I don't know if like child children have like regular practices I mean I had been doing that since I was a kid. Like, I think, um, you know, I mean, my parents were immigrants. We didn't, we didn't like grow up with much. Like it wasn't like a, I don't even, they just wanted us to have our culture. And I think in some ways it was easier for them to ship us off for the summer than it was to find a babysitter so that they could work. Um, and I mean, I was a, like, I was one of those kids who would come home from school and just like open the door and nobody was there. Like that was just like my upbringing. So I think like, I don't know if it was practices to say that kept me grounded, but I was a kid and like, it was all I knew. It was just what I was accustomed to like going back and forth. And um, I definitely think that it created a lot of polarity within myself and not really feeling like I belonged truly in either one of these worlds where like when I would be in America, I felt different. Um, and then when I was in, you know, Macedonia or Kosovo, I also felt different. Um, I felt like I was just like this weird in-between space, which maybe is why I feel so comfortable in the in-between, um, where I like the tunnels, I love the tower card. It's just like kind of what I know. Um, but I was a kid and I think I always just, I always was like into magic and I was always into like the practices and um, like would very often be like talking to myself and like doing little like ritual work with like flowers in the backyard and things like that. But it was just my natural way of like communicating with the world around me. It wasn't really like, I didn't think about it too much, I think, <laughs> I think. And that's what's so special about it because you were able to explore the world and connect in this intuitive way without, you know, all of the external chatter. So that's so beautiful that you're able to create your own flow with nature and connecting. Yeah, for sure. I think it definitely was beautiful. Um, it definitely came with its challenges as well. I mean, it's always tough being, I mean, I, like I started elementary school and I didn't speak English. Like, I mean, there's definitely things that like were tough about it, but it, um, it definitely did give me like a bigger, I guess, like width of understanding. And um, even like today when I see certain issues coming up in politics or in, um, in the wellness industry in general, like I have very many qualms with the wellness industry, but um, I'm able to kind of pick up not just like what's going on in America, but have like a second world to sort of refer back to and think about how like what works in either of, of these two spaces and what doesn't work because there's good and bad in both um, and kind of understanding like, I don't know, like a bigger, like a different sort of way of doing things you know like my parents grew up in communism like that's not America and so it's it, it's interesting to kind of understand like the different ways that people live uh and how there there isn't just one one way and um yeah that's so important to really zoom out and see the different perspectives and in the realm of feeling different and not belonging I feel like the internet has really 
emphasize that in a way. And I feel like personally, I don't belong anywhere, even on, on the internet where you can find the like niche, niche, niche thing. And you're like, oh, but I still don't belong quite. So it's beautiful that through your adventuring, you were able to really connect with your intuitive power and align with nature in this way. But I'm also really excited to have these controversial conversations about how can we find that belonging inside so it doesn't matter when the world is like spinning everywhere. I mean, I, like personally, I think that yes, we can find belonging inside, but I totally believe in like the collective mindset and it's about making, I think it's about making sure that whoever is in your space or in your energy feels like they belong and feels comfortable and safe um and we can do that by just very simply thinking about the other uh, just the same way we think about the self um and so yes we can cultivate a sense of belonging within ourselves and a sense of like strength within ourselves but everybody needs community support we all need social support and if somebody is feeling othered or if somebody is feeling like they don't belong in some sort of way then whoever does belong or is part of the larger collective I believe it's their responsibility to make sure that whoever is feeling other does not feel othered um and I think that that's like a huge conversation that has been happening always but especially this year um like 2020 I should say and so yeah we can cultivate that sense of belonging within ourselves, but like no like no man's an island and we can we need that social support and people matter and making sure that we tell people that they matter and that they're important. Um, and it doesn't matter like what level of knowing somebody that you have. It could be somebody that you just meet on the street. It could be somebody that you're just talking to or a, friend, a lifelong friend, like they should know that they matter um, in, in the collective as, as well as within the self. Absolutely. And that collective energy is felt all of the time. So even in those moments where we may feel alone or what have you, we have this ripple effect that is conscious and unconscious to some, where if you're seeing a new person on the street and you just wave and say hello, that has a ripple effect in the collective. So from your perspective, what advice do you have to creating those safe spaces and lifting each other up when it might be scary? That's a good question. I mean, I think that's something I've been really deliberating on. Um, I mean, I am a facilitator, like I hold space a lot, like I hold circle, I teach classes and workshops, and I'm constantly questioning, like questioning myself um, and what is the correct way to hold space? Not that there is like one correct way, but what is the best way to create a safe container? Um, and I think like nothing is perfect. And so you're always gonna like mess up. Um, I was going to curse. I like curse so much. I'm really trying to like hold myself back. Um, but we're always going to mess up. And um, I think that what we can do is really just try, I mean, try our best to like think in other people's shoes, like empathy is the best sort of method, I think, but also having like tools in your toolbox mm -hmm. um, and making sure that you're, you're like prepared and you're qualified to be holding space. Um, I think it's really important to do trainings. Um, there's so many trainings out there for holistic practitioners to become trauma-informed. I think that's really important to take trauma information trainings. Um, part of the reason why I went back to school to get my second degree for psychology was because I was like, okay, I work with people all the time. I work with them in private sessions for like herbal consultations and tarot readings. I work with them in group settings when I'm holding circle or I'm teaching classes. And you really never know what is going to trigger someone. You really don't. And you don't know um, where anyone is in their healing space or, or how far they've come to be able to accept certain things. Um, and I feel like I've been in circles where I felt like the facilitator did not do a good job at creating a safe space or I have left circles feeling triggered. And I hope and I wish that nobody has ever left my space like that, but they probably have because that's just what happens, like people, human error exists. Um, and so I went back for my degree in psychology because I was like, this field obviously has been in existence for a really long time. And we need to be more 
qualified on a scientific level um, where people have done experiments and they've done observational studies and they've been practicing the, and, and learning about the mind for year, like, I don't know how many years, I think since like the 1700s, I'm guessing. Um, so why not like get more scientifically qualified? Because I think just having good intentions is not enough. And I think just saying this is a safe place is not enough. Um, you know, I see a lot of people going back and forth in our community on if there should be like a facilitator or if everything should be held in open circle. And while it's really nice to have everyone feeling equal in that space, if there isn't rules or structure, you don't know what like human error will create and what that ripple effect will have. So I don't know, I think if you're trying to create like a safe space for people to feel welcome, and for people to feel safe, it's about becoming informed, um, informed on what trauma is, informed on what type of stressors can affect people in their minds. I mean, I think that like on a basic level, you should know the difference between a psychogenic and a neurogenic stressor and what that affects, how that affects the body. You should know about like allostatic overload, like the very simple things that happen so that you can recognize it in the spaces that you, you're in so that you can create the least amount of harm, <laughs> if that sort of makes sense. So I think just having good intentions isn't enough. Um, I think being informed and being educated um, and being up to date with whatever is going on in like the world with social issues, because even if it's not affecting you, it's probably affecting somebody in your circle and understanding how it affects the people in your circle is gonna be able to make you more aware and mindful of how you're responding to that person on that particular day. Absolutely. And yeah. I appreciate you laying this foundation because when we are in person, it's so more intuitive when you can read and feel people's energy. And with online spaces and creating that safe space virtually, yes, on FaceTime, like how we are now, we can feel that but that's not always the case. So being able to have that awareness and knowledge so we can really keep evolving together because our collective energy is all connected. So I'm really curious to see how we can keep unfolding this safe space of belonging online as these platforms continue to evolve because it's scary, but there's also great opportunities. So that tower card is really... Part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think there's so much opportunity, um, but I think the internet in general is like when everyone has a voice, it's really hard to filter out like what's true and what's not true. I mean, we see that all the time, um, you know, like with all the like fake news. But I think it's important to kind of um, I don't know, like be discerning about and and come everything with come at everything with a critical eye like don't just believe everything you hear and everything you read um and you know believe people believe people's stories be, believe how they feel or how they're representing themselves um yeah i think it's really important to create like safe spaces and the internet does give us a lot of opportunity to do a lot but it also gives us a lot of opportunity to like mess up <laughs> so just trying to kind of be um the most informed as you can as you're like kind of going out there absolutely and i'm curious what are some of your personal habits around balancing the boundaries with technology especially when you're creating your magic yeah i mean it's definitely tough because i feel like I mean, I'm a small business owner and I'm the only employee. So I have to like kind of touch my phone all the time. It's really, it really is tough to create boundaries because I'm doing like, you know, marketing and Instagram and writing newsletters and <laughs> she wants my pillow. Oh, um, <laughs> and like creating all of these different um, like platforms and being online. And I see clients almost every day. So I'm on Zoom all the time. It really is hard to to create those boundaries, but some things that I do is like, you know, when I'm not, when I don't have to be on my phone, I will randomly just like turn my phone on like airplane mode or like uh, the do not disturb. Um, I've started this past few weeks not bringing my phone into bed with me. So at 9 p.m. I leave my phone in my living room and then I go to bed. <laughs> um, 
And then like in the morning, obviously I'll grab it. But I think it's really hard to create space these days. I don't know. I think it's it's different from person to person, but I try to turn it off every once in a while. But, you know, at the same time, I live alone. I'm like always by myself, especially now with the quarantine. So I do love having my phone next to me for like that social support. Um, I send voice notes to my friends pretty much all day long. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's tough. I try, but I definitely am not like doing the best um, at staying away from my phone. Well, I love to hear that you incorporate practices like voice notes. I know we exchanged a couple too. Yeah. Just hearing the tone of voice and the tempo, it adds so much more to the conversation rather than, you know, what does this mean? How does, how do you interpret this? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's like easier and like, I don't know, sometimes you can hear what the person's doing in the background. So it almost feels like you're having a conversation, like you're actually like able to hear, like you can hear them washing dishes or like making food and you're like, okay, this is kind of cool. It's like we're in the same room, but we're not. Um, and I do think like hearing the voice is like so, so nice. And even just like seeing somebody's face like makes all the difference. Absolutely. Oh, I'm so grateful we could dive into all these different arrays of the wellness and tech I feel like everything's all intertwined and it does make me feel like the collective even though the internet is kind of like mind-boggling it is an energy exchange like to power on your computer and all of these things have you noticed an energetic connection when you're using your phone or connecting with your community um I, like with the internet or like with the people that I'm talking to? Um, I guess both, but more specifically yeah. like person to person. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, even without like seeing someone, you can have that energetic connection. I feel like that's, that's pretty much what I do all day by doing like my herbal sessions with people and like the tarot readings with people. I kind of am diving into their energy even without um, having them in front of me. I think that that's definitely possible. Um, yeah, I think you can definitely do that. And we're in the age of Aquarius, like it's finally here, like the age of Aquarius, like Aquarius, like Aquarius brought on the internet, like Aquarius rules the internet. So we're in that age right now. So we're kind of like innovating what it means to be connected. Um, Aquarius is also like the sign of the humanitarian. It's like the sign that rules friendship. So we're re, we're re kind of like creating what uh, like relationships within the world really look like in this sort of energetic uh, internet space. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I've made friends over the internet that like live far away, or I have clients that I've never seen in person before. And it's just because, I don't know, Instagram. <laughs> I love it. And I appreciate the connection back to astrology in the age of Aquarius. At a high level, are there any aspects around the age of Aquarius that you recommend us to keep in mind? Um, well, I mean, I'm not like an astrologer. <laughs> I will say that I definitely don't like qualify as an astrologer. I do look at people's charts when I do um, like herbal sessions just to kind of see what their ruling planets are and some like major aspects that might be affecting them because that kind of helps me figure out their constitution. Um, but I mean, right now we are in Mercury retrograde, um, which is always like a time to kind of be reflective and go inwards. I know people have like this big fear around Mercury retrograde, but I think like that's one of those things the internet blew up. I think it's just a time to kind of stop and like go inwards and reflect and see um, how that energy works with you. And if you wanna see particularly how the Mercury retrograde is going to affect you, see where Mer like what house Mercury is transiting in your personal chart that's like a really nice way to look at it. Like I know Mercury right now is in my seventh house of relationships. So I know that like Mercury is kind of going retrograde in that end. So I have to be more reflective about the relationships and partnerships that I'm forming in this time or in the past or in the future, just kind of thinking about those things. Um, but Saturn just went into Aquarius. So anyone who's born with Saturn in Aquarius is having a Saturn return right now, including myself, um, usually those between 27 and 30. Um, and that's going to end in like two to three years, I believe. I don't know the exact dates. Um, yeah, and when you're having a Saturn return, it's just like, <laughs> it's like an incubator pe period where you just are like in, like in it. Like, and I keep wanting to curse and I keep stopping myself. So I'm doing a good job. 
but you're like in the tunnel and um once you come out on the other side you're like a full-blown adult that's like how it feels like to me but I'm sure like a, a real astrologer would have a better um way of saying that but I think like for the next few weeks just taking it easy and kind of like being reflective and um yeah I was watching uh I was watching like a Instagram live between two astrologers and they were just saying like temper your expectations in this time. And I've been kind of like thinking about that a lot. Um, like whenever like things come up and like just temper, 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 temper. And yeah. So beautiful. I appreciate you sharing and building off those reflective moments. How have your potions and everything been supporting that internal connection? Um, I can't do anything without my potions. I like, am so connected to my herbal practice. It's like every day I have some sort of herb and be it tincture, tea, oxymo or whatever. Um, but I mean, it's really, it's really interesting. I think that anyone can start an herbal practice and it doesn't have to be super complicated or super hard. Um, I think the easiest way to start is by like framing things in elements because we all have some connection to the elements and it can be the simple four earth water air fire um and thinking about like your own constitution and what you feel most like um, and you can do that by looking at your chart or just kind of tapping into yourself and being like what do i feel like right now am i like super energetic maybe i have some rage maybe i have some anxiety maybe i'm feeling super passionate or creative and you're probably kind of aligning with fire right there um, and so by checking in to see where you are in your constitution, or maybe looking at your birth chart and knowing like, for me, since I'm a Leo rising, I know the sun rules my chart. So I know that fire is something that I'm always going to have with me. I'm a very fiery person. And I can kind of see like, when I take fire herbs, it feels good because that's what I naturally am inclined towards. So by working with something that feels comfortable for you, you're working within your, um, within your own sort of element. And that's gonna help you sort of like, just reaffirm things. But if you're looking to balance it out, so I know that I can get super anxious. I also know I have a temper. So, but I'm also super passionate and creative. So I know that to temper that out, if I'm feeling too fiery and my anxiety is like, boom, 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 I'm going to work with some earth to ground me down. So maybe I'll pull some burdock out of my little apothecary and start drinking burdock tea for a little bit. And that always just like whoop, like sinks me back into the earth. So when working with herbs, it's really easy to start just kind of noticing what your constitution is like elementally and seeing how you can kind of um, work with that to, to either work with it or to kind of find the balance with that, depending on where you are. Um, and, you know, that again goes into like each of the elements is associated with different body systems. So I'll stick with fire because that's what we've been talking about. Um, so fire, for example, among many other things, rules like the liver. And something that we I learned in my herbalism class and in my herbalism trainings is that when we have anger or trauma or pain and it sits unprocessed or it sits repressed, um, it'll sit in the liver and the liver will turn it into anxiety <laughs> and fear. Um, so one of the ways that if I see somebody who has a lot of anxiety and is really ready to face, um, cause they have to be really ready to face that anxiety and what that means and that anger, then we'll work together on cleansing the liver using different er herbs that work with the liver. And you'll see as you're cleansing the liver, and I always say working in cycles is the best because nobody can do everything all at once. Um, you know, I really like the image of like the Ouroboros or like the snake that lives in the belly. And each time the snake comes out through the mouth, it brings up a piece of healing and then it comes back down to rest. So working in cycles, just like the cycles of the earth is the best way to do it because then you have periods of rest and periods of work. So by cleansing the liver in this example, um, in cycles, you might be able to build out or take out pieces of that rage, pieces of that fear and look at it and be able to say, okay, how do I want to process this? Am I ready to fully process this? And that's going to help kind of bring out the, bring down the anxiety and like bring a little bit more calm, but it has to be done kind of systematically. And um, that's like the difference between herbs and like prescription medication, where um, you're not going to feel the results um, 
in a day. You know, you're not going to take burdock once and then your anxiety is going to be gone. Um, you're not going to take burdock every day and your anxiety is going to be gone. Um, and not that burdock is like really the only thing for anxiety, but beyond that, just like you're not going to take an herb and then the, everything is going to be gone. You have to really work on it in like a psychosomatic level, working at it consciously and mindfully, but also like physically, it's like the combination of the two. And this is what I mean when I say I'm really like into that Taurus Scorpio polarity because the Taurus is like, it has to be in your body. You have to feel it in your body. And then the Scorpio is like, but it's also in your mind. It's also um, in, your, in your head. It's also the psychology of it. So being able to marry those two practices, I think is the best way to slowly overcome um, any of these issues that you're having. And the herbs are just like one tool in this practice. Um, they're just one part of, of creating this space. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or if I just went on a whole tangent. <laughs> yes, yeah, so beautiful. And I appreciate the cycles. And for someone that's ready to take action and really do this deeper work, how do you recommend them to get started? With a practitioner, 100%. Because I think that um, herbs can be, I mean, herbs are like the original medicine and a lot of medicines are like pure extractions of herbs and they can be um, almost like replications of herbs. So herbs are medicine. And with that, um, they have a lot of uh, contraindications and not everything works for everyone. Um, so I do really think that if you are tackling something um, like serious, work with a practitioner. And if you know if you have like pre-existing conditions or allergies, work with a practitioner. If you just kind of want to start to develop a relationship to plants and start to develop um, kind of an awareness to the plant, I would say start with meditation. See if you can ask a plant ally to come through in your meditation to show itself to you. Go out on walks. Um, notice what plants are kind of talking to you. Notice if there's a plant that you keep seeing over and over again, find out what that plant is, find out what it does. Um, one of the beautiful things um, about these herbs is that a lot of the plants that we call weeds actually are really medicinal herbs. And so you'll find them growing between the sidewalks, you'll find them growing in your grass, in your gardens. Um, things that you're pulling out are really medicinal. Um, one of my favorite, favorite herbs that has been one of my biggest like plant allies for healing uh, trauma and healing um, my connection to my intuition and healing my like feminine body um, has been mugwort um, and like mugwort I like I have such a deep relationship with this plant and you can find mugwort everywhere um, like it's literally con constantly growing in between the sidewalks it's a very powerful plant um, and just to give you some background, like its scientific name is Artemisia vulgaris. Um, so it's associated with the goddess Artemis. So it's a warrior plant. Um, she's the goddess of the hunt. So it's really connected to using that gut intuition. I always think of mugwort as being like associated with air um, for a few reasons. One, because it has a silver back. That's one of the ways that you can really recognize it. And that silver almost feels swords-like to me. And the shape of the leaves almost look like little swords, um, each one that's coming out. And it actually like kind of tastes like metal too, like like bitter metal, which I know sounds like gross, but I like love it. Um, once you get used to it, it's a little bit better. And, you know, it helps um, with cultivating intuition. If you take it before bed, it'll have you lucid dreaming, but on a physical level, level it's a bitter herb, so it'll help you digest bitter experiences. Um, it's an amemagogue, so it'll help release uh, your menstrual cycle. So if you have trouble with menstruation, um, you should use it, but it's contraindicated for those pregnant or trying to become pregnant because it keeps the uterine lining really thin. So that's been a really big um, herbal ally for me is working with like warrior plants like mugwort. Um, and that's one of those plants that you will just find like growing out anywhere. And there's so many plants like that. So if you're trying to cultivate like an herbal practice, like just go out and take a walk and you don't even have to live somewhere that's like fully like rural like you can really live in Brooklyn and find mugwort on the side of the road like it's just everywhere um so yeah I love that thank you for sharing and I feel the warrior energy and for people that are curious to learn more about the how why and all the science behind it what offerings are you currently sharing that they can explore 
Yeah, so I do have a few offerings right now. Of course, they can work on me one on one um, and do like client sessions if they're looking to like heal something or work with a practitioner to go through something. And that's always like a learning experience on its own. Um, I also am teaching a um, intuitive herbalism course, which starts at the end of the month. The 28th is the first day. It's a five week course and we go through each of the five elements. I added ether in there. Um, and that is beginner friendly. I'm gonna be doing that for beginners. It's supposed to be for anyone. I mean, even if you're like a clinical herbalist and you haven't connected to the plants in a very like intuitive way, it would be a good way to kind of connect in the magic part. Um, but for somebody who's never even heard of like mugwort or anything like that, if you join the class, it's it's aimed for beginners. It's aimed to be very like um, rudimentary, but um yeah so those are my two major offerings every month i write a newsletter on the new moon and full moon where i talk about a different herb for the season um i will be partnering with the wells cafe to be coming out with um some videos about herb information so i definitely suggest following the wells cafe if you aren't already um yeah and i do new moon parties where i talk about herbs oh, like Basically, if you follow me on Instagram, come to my workshops, come to my classes. I am always teaching classes. On Valentine's Day, I'm teaching a class on Venus herbs, to connect to that Venus energy. So if you follow me, you will you will learn about herbs. <laughs> I love it. There's so much to explore and I appreciate all of the synergy of the cycles and just everything that's interconnected. Yeah, thank you, thank you, yeah. So beautiful. Well, I look forward to sharing and continuing to explore this work together. I appreciate you taking the time to chat real talk. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. It's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Yes. And do you mind just quickly sharing your social media handles and website? Oh, yes. So my website is potionsbyleary.com and that's L-I-R-I -I for Leary. Um, and then my Instagram is at potionsbyleary. Um, yeah, potionsbyleary.com and at potionsbyleary. If you want to reach out to me directly, you can send me an email at potionsbyleary at gmail.com. Um, yeah, that's, that's how you find me. <laughs> yay, yay, yay. I'm so excited. Thank you so much. And until next time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was nice meeting you. Bye.